Next, if we look in Philippians, we see an example from Paul. And this example tells me that, you know, God's grace is not always feeling good. Sometimes God in his grace allows what we would call bad things to happen. In verse 29 of Philippians 1, we see, For to you it has been granted on behalf of Christ, not only to believe in him, but also to suffer for his sake, having the same conflict which you saw in me, and now here is in me. Now, there's been lots of ideas of what kind of suffering Paul went through. We know that he went through a lot of persecution. We also know that he went through shipwrecks and things like that. We also know that he had some kind of a physical ailment. There are people in other parts of the world that are suffering persecution. We see about it in the news. I don't want to go into too much detail about it, but we know it's there. And it's not just happening to people because of their political standing and what country they're from, but it's also happening to entire villages of indigenous people who have given their lives to Jesus Christ and have refuted and rejected the God of Islam. So they are being persecuted. They are being granted the grace of suffering for Christ. Let that sink in just a little bit. Now we, in America, at this point, are not suffering in that way. However, our rights are being chipped away at, aren't they? And there's going to come a point where we have to decide, I'm going to break the law, because it is better to obey God than man. We also have suffering that goes on even physically within each of us. I don't think any of us is in perfect health. And if you think about it, there's something that you really wish God would just take away. And Paul asked that God would take away his ailment three times. And God said, My grace is sufficient for you because my power is made perfect in your weakness. So I believe God did these things specifically to Paul so that Paul's weakness would show God's strength, but also as an example to us so that when we are suffering these things, we can remember that God is actually being gracious because we're still alive, we're still breathing, and we're still kicking, even though all of these things have happened to us over the years. So God is gracious. That's the example from Paul. Now in 1 Peter 2.20, we read, For what credit is it if when you are beaten for your faults, you take it patiently? But when you do good and suffer, if you take it patiently, this is commendable before God. So what, what I'm hearing from this is it's not just a matter of suffering to enjoy God's grace that you've endured. We also suffer so that we can really give God glory. And so we give Him glory by letting people know what's happening, letting people know what our weakness is. Unfortunately, we like to put on our masks, don't we? We don't want to share our weakness with other people because, well, they might think differently of us. But God wants us to be transparent with one another so that we really can bear one another's burdens, so that we can show the love of Christ to one another, so that we can pray for one another, and ultimately so that God can be glorified in this body. But if we continue to suffer without giving him glory, then that suffering doesn't have its full benefit in terms of glorifying God. The third example that I saw in our three passages was found in John chapter 8. And this is a famous story of the prostitute. Well, you don't know if she was a prostitute or not. We honestly don't know anything about this woman. We know that she was caught in a sinful act. An act that takes two. And for whatever reason, they decided not to bring in the guy. I wonder if the guy was standing there in their midst, ready to throw a stone. I don't know. But I find it interesting. But here she was, standing accused. And Jesus, of course, 
said to them, Whoever is without sin can cast the first stone. We know that nobody is without sin. And so they all left. And Jesus was left alone and the woman standing in the midst. When Jesus had raised himself up and saw no one but the woman, he said to her, Woman, where are your accusers? Has no one condemned you? And she said, No one, Lord. And Jesus said to her, Neither do I condemn you. Go and sin no more. So the lesson that I see from this passage is that grace is not simply to forgive us of sin. Grace is supposed to transform us. It's supposed to cause us to go and sin no more. In 1 Peter 1, verses 13 to 16, we read, Therefore, gird up your loins of your mind, be sober, and rest your hope fully upon the grace that is to be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. As obedient children, not conforming yourselves to the former lusts, as in your ignorance, but as he who called you is holy, you also be holy in all your conduct, because it is written, Be holy, for I am holy. And for whatever reason, I have that slide there twice, so you can click twice. So how do we respond to the grace of God? As I look at the three passages, there are four responses that I saw in these passages. So the first response is repentance. Remember that Ezekiel 33, 11 passage? God does not delight in the death of the wicked, therefore turn. Repent. He wants us to repent. In 2 Corinthians 6, 2, the apostle says, Behold, now is the day of salvation. Now is the accepted time. So we, this is not something you want to think about. This is something you want to do. You want to turn away from your wickedness. You have to understand that when Jesus died on the cross, he did it for you. He didn't just do it. He did it for you. He did it for me. And until we recognize just how sinful we are, we won't be able to understand just how gracious God is. Secondly, we should foster an attitude of gratitude. In 1 Thessalonians 5.18, the apostle says, In everything give thanks, because this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. So a proper response to God's grace is to thank him. Thank him. In Hebrews 12.1, we read that we should persevere. And this is a, an interesting passage. I'm going to go ahead and read it because I don't remember exactly how it goes. But it, it talks about how we have a cloud of witnesses and they are cheering us on. The cloud of witnesses, of course, are the people that have gone before us in the faith. He says, Therefore we also, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which so easily ensnares us and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. Endurance and perseverance are things that we do because we need to finish. We want to finish well. Sometimes we'll try something and it doesn't work and we think, well, I'll never try that again. But that's not the way the Christian walk is supposed to be. We're supposed to get back up. We're supposed to keep putting one foot in front of the other. And if we do fall, well, we've got to scrape the, the dirt off of our knees. And we need to keep on going. That's what perseverance is all about. And then finally, transformation is what we are supposed to allow God to do in our lives as a result of the grace that he's given to us. He didn't save us so that we could just keep on sinning. He saved us so that we could be different, so that we can live a life that's holy. Romans 12, 2 says, Do not be conformed to the world. Now, we can look at the world and think about what the world is like. And we know what the world is like. We know that the world is changing the moral code. They either are saying that different things that used to be wrong are now right. And those people that thought those things were wrong are now narrow-minded. And that 
can have to do with sexual relations, it can do with uh, ethics, integrity, gambling, uh, excessive use of alcohol, and all of these things are now looked upon favorably because everybody's doing it. We are not to be conformed to the world. We are to be transformed by the renewing of our mind. And the renewing of our mind happens as we meditate on Scripture and as we pray to the Lord. With that in mind, let's pray. Lord, I thank you for the grace that you have shown to us. I thank you that your grace is unmeasurable and that it is free to all who will receive it. Lord, I thank you for the way that you've showered grace upon us. It is by your grace that we have not been consumed. This little church still stands 150 years after it started, and it is still filled with people who love you. Lord, I thank you for that. And I thank you that you have preserved us individually. We've had scary and carried lives, but you have been good. Lord, if there are any in this room that have not repented and turned from their wicked ways to you, I pray that this would be the moment when they give their lives over to you. And Lord, for each of us, I pray for that spirit of perseverance so that when we do fall, we would get back up, we would brush ourselves off and keep on going. Lord, your Holy Spirit is there to guide us, to comfort us, and to challenge us. I pray that you would Give him in full measure. Through Jesus Christ we pray. Amen.